Here's a call sheet from January 15th, 1946, in the middle of shooting The Sin of Harold Diddlebuck. This was Preston Sturges directing, Howard Hughes producing, Harold Lloyd starring. I actually really liked that movie. I don't think it's one of his best movies, and he didn't like it at all, but I, I thought it was pretty good. He didn't like the way it was cut, that's And there's, sure. a, there's one from January 1st in here, I think, that says Happy New Year and all that. Yeah, here we go. You know, something happened um, right before Harold died that was unbelievably flattering to me. Um, very nostalgic now, but it was really great. And he asked me if I would take care of his makeup kit. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, I'd be happy to do it. I didn't realize that the makeup kit was really this treasure trove of, of Harold Lloyd items and nostalgia, which included 11 pair of his original glasses and uh, the hands that he had worn and a few other things. And of course, this thing looks like a beat up old suitcase. It probably wouldn't be worth anything to a junk collector, but to a film fan, boy, this is amazing. He put this kit together in 1918. We have a mirror here that has his name on it, the way it always was, and this is what he used, and some of the gloves that he used. Now, there's a number of these boxes in here that they're all from an optical company on Broadway and Fifth in downtown LA. Name of the company is the Reynolds Company, and these are the guys that made Harold's glasses. And so there were quite a few of those in there. Here's another pair of his glasses. This, this pair happens to be a little bit darker. The darker pairs were the ones that were used in the um, earlier movies. The lighter pairs were used in later movies. This was used by his makeup man, Wally Howe, who was also an actor that he worked with to just brush him off. But we have pancake makeup and um, safety pins, Max Factor stuff, Johnson & Johnson baby powder, um, he, that pale face makeup he had in here, more pairs of the glasses. Here's some more stuff. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Here's a pair of glasses that Harold wore at personal appearances because, and how do you know that is because they were made by the Reynolds company, exactly the same frames, but these actually have glass in them. So he would, when he went on personal appearances, he would wear, you know, lenses so that people wouldn't look at, at this actor wearing glasses right. with no lenses. What would be the point of that? So there's a number of these pairs that he would keep in here for personal appearances. Um, something else that's really interesting in here too is this pair of glasses. This is a pair of glasses with smoked lenses that are very, very dark blue and these were the glasses, and we have photos of this actually, that he wore while he was recuperating from the accident. He had his damaged eye. This is the stuff that he wore uh, when you see pictures of he and his dad sitting around and his arm in the cast and all that stuff. This is, these are the actual pair of glasses from 1919 that he was wearing. So, you know, luckily for us, he never threw out anything. And so he even has these glasses. Um, but we have, a, we have a lot of different things in here, towels and brushes and sponges that he used. These are, <laughs> they still have the makeup on them, you know, <laughs> that he used, um, powder puffs, all kinds of stuff. It's just that his comb, you know. It's amazing to think just how pliable these, some of this stuff still is dating back to 1918. Yeah, I like this here, look at this. This is grease makeup, Elizabeth Arden makeup dating back to the teens. He's, um, he so was he lucky hit. for us that he kept everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he literally kept everything. Thread. Thread, yeah. Here, here's the, the, the needles for the, the sewing. This was a device that they used for the glove. The sewing when, kit. Yeah, when he had the glove on, they had um, these little eyelets on it, and they would pull this thing really tight, and then they put a, a well, on this hand, actually, they put a strap on it that kept it taut all the time. So, the, so that the material wouldn't fold. It'd be taut like skin all the time, and this was used to pull that up. A lot of stuff. Oh, brushes, they have eyeliner brushes and that type of stuff. Here's more, this is, a, this is more talcum powder that's in here. Um, this is actually used for gloves. This was something that came with the golden gloves, and so he would put this inside. He could slip his hand in much easier, so. Everything's in here, and uh, once he asked me to take care of this form. It was a huge honor for me to do that, and that's what I've been doing, and nothing's been changed. He'd probably be happy about that because uh, <laughs> yep. he left it exactly the way he had it. All right, here we have, this is actually the first 
prosthetic that Harold ever wore. It's the 1919 glove that was made for um, Haunted Spooks. This is, I told you, this came up as an idea of Roach and Sam Goldwyn. But you notice that, it, first of all, it looks very, very small. It, it's not, it stretches on a hand once it gets on, but they needed it to be extremely tight and then he wore an apparatus that kept it tight, pulled up on his shoulder, he would wear it, and this thing would clip down here underneath his shirt and keep it tight all the time. But he would make his hand up. This was basically the color of the makeup that he was wearing. And all this was was a kid glove, a patent leather glove. Um, the, here's the thumb. The thumb would have an insert in it that would add the thumb or what looked like the thumb. These would be his real fingers, these three. And... And you can see that the middle finger and the index finger are simply sewn together with thread. This is what Goldwyn devised and came up with him. And then Harold would put it on. And when he bent his hand, he could do this, or he could do this, or he could point this way. Anytime he used this finger, this finger would move. So people really didn't notice that there was a big change or that he was missing anything on his hand. It was really, really ingenious, actually. And this glove... Um, because it was this color would blend right in. You know, obviously these were black and white movies and they were using panchromatic um, black and white negative stock so you couldn't really tell any difference and it, and it did resemble skin a bit and that's how they did it. And it was, it was something that simple but it became the device which put him back in the driver's seat as far as an actor is concerned and convinced him that he could still continue with his acting career. Later on, um, Wally Westmore actually made rubber hands for him and rubber prosthetics that looked even more realistic than this. He had to do a scene in um, Professor Beware where he was in just a tank top. So he was in like an underwear shirt and they had to show his whole arm. So Westmore made him a thing that actually attached to his real palm. And that was really, really well done too. That was 1938. But anyway, this was the original glove from, uh, from uh, 1919. And sometimes you notice that the change of color was simply because of the change of the panchromatic makeup that they were wearing. This matched his face color a little bit later, so I would think that this thing came along sometimes in the sometime in the late 20s or early 30s. But this was the actual color of the makeup in those days, so that'll give you a good idea of what those guys really looked like in those days. Well, as Dave mentioned, when he first started the glasses character, the glasses were a little bit thicker and bigger, but you, you explained that he ended up with smaller glasses so that the expression, or right. his expressions, wouldn't be lost. And here are a pair of original Haroloid glasses. These date back to around 1926. Um, there's a number of these that we have in his makeup kit, but as you can see, no lenses. And he very rarely, and one one reeler once, he did a thing where he cleaned his the lenses by taking a rag through it, but most of the time he played this as straight and wanted people to think that they were um, glasses with lenses. And he also thought that this was a uh, kind of a symbol of the everyday man on the street. You notice that they're really bent around the ear area because of all the running and jumping and stunts and stuff. He didn't want these to come off. So these, once they were on, they were really on. But Harold had a thin face, and these are actually thin glasses. Um, sometimes people think that the, because he was known for the glasses that they were much, much bigger and much darker. But the base makeup that he had on was very white, kind of palish. So anything black or dark would really play against that. And he had a very thin face. He had a thin nose, a thin face. and. Um, these fit across the majority of the area of his eye, eye area in his face, so here they are. But these are Haroloid glasses that are now like 80 years old. Yeah. And they're still in beautiful condition. Everything in that makeup kit, you know, one day he just closed the kit and said, okay, well, I've retired now and nothing was touched again. The pancake makeup and the hands and everything. Yeah, just you know. stayed there. I remember that about the, uh, the makeup, that his makeup was fairly yeah. simple. You know, just being probably the white pancake base makeup and then um, the glasses. And I think he had a little bit of, you know, rouge on the lips and stuff. But when he was out of makeup, you know, just the regular guy, man on the street, back then when he was a big star, nobody recognized him. You know, was, no, because with the hat on and stuff, nobody really knew his hair color a, a lot of times. The, with the makeup gone, you didn't recognize him. And I remember that story he told us that he went to a premiere of something with... Um, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., Mary Pickford, and himself, and after and coming out, all the crowd outside mobbed 
you know, Fairbanks and Pickford because they recognized him because yeah. that's what they looked like all the time. And so Harold, who really didn't like, you know, being mobbed like that and stuff, just stood off to the side, having a grand old time watching his friends getting mobbed by the scene. And of course, Fairbanks, who's a pretty, you know, much of a cut up at the time, said, Oh, if you want to get a, an autograph or you want to see a real from a star, really big star, yeah, if you want to get an autograph from a really big star, that's Harold Lloyd, <laughs> you know, and everybody went, ah. and of course they just left them and mobbed Harold, they went in and like, thanks a lot, Doug, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. type of thing, yeah. so I always remember that one. B.B. Daniels was a 15-year-old girl when she started working for, for the Roach Studios as Harold Lloyd's leading lady, and she made literally over 120 movies with Harold Lloyd, became a big star later, but... Um, they were actually engaged once, as a matter of fact. You know what was funny about the two of them was he always said that they were they loved to dance. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, how he would like master these games and then kind of bring you into this, weave you in and then like kind of say, right. oh, I'm gonna win. He and B.B. Daniels became these ballroom dancers that were unbelievable. They made a, sh there's a film called Young Mr. Jazz, which is a one reeler made in 1918. And there's a scene in it where they go dancing, and you can see just from the way they were dancing, and they were the dancers, yeah. you know, they were like the foxtrots of the day. They're really good, mm -hmm. like really good. So they would go downtown and win all these contests, which would supplement their income, you right. know, because these are contests, you know, you pay a couple bucks for people to win, and they would have like a blue plate dinner for free. Mm -hmm. And he was just absolutely taken with her. I think when she was 17, he proposed to her. Um, and she didn't, she loved Harold, but she didn't take up on the, uh, on the proposal, he gave her, actually gave her an engagement ring with some diamonds in it, and um, she took the ring and had cufflings made that, uh, from the same stones that were in the ring, and he literally wore those to the day he died. Those were his dress cufflings, and he wore them. And see, now he thought those were good luck, mm -hmm. and so he always wore those. But he really liked B.B. Daniels. Yeah, I think, well, there was the, the, the concrete vault, the, the fireproof vault that was the one up around the, the paramba, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it was called. Whatever the it was called. <laughs> you know, um, we, uh, Dave and I were fans of Harold Lloyd, you know, not only because he was a nice guy, but because we knew of what his place in cinema history was. And, and Sue Lloyd, his granddaughter, was having a birthday party. Um, again, another birthday party. It was probably the following year. It was probably in 68 or something. And she said, well, what do you think we ought to do? And we went to Harold and said, why don't, we, why don't you run Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy for everybody? And he thought, wow, you know, these are teenagers and young kids and they want to go to one of my movies for a birthday party? Okay. So he rented a screening room down on the Sunset Strip and, we, and Sue invited maybe 15 of her friends and we ran Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy and everybody loved it. But... What happened was when he went to get the movie out, he took us to a vault on the property. Now, on the property, there were like four walk-in vaults, including one in the house that was called the Game Vault, where there was nothing but old games from the 20s and 30s. But they also had these film vaults, which were these big concrete vaults with a, you know, with a, with a bank vault door yeah, on the front with, a, with a, you know, the combination lock and everything. And he took us in to get it, and Dave and I noticed that uh, after they had done the second compilation movie called Funny Side of Life, that the, the films were kind of in a, a, a disarray. They were kind of in this state of disarray. And uh, negatives were with positives. Nitrate film was with safety film. Yeah, a couple the of prints. reels. You'd have a, a, you know, a six reeler or something, only four reels were there. It's like, yeah. oh, what, where is everything? It was kind of a mishmash of stuff because he had had someone who worked on those films as an editor, a guy named Duncan Mansfield, who had done... A number of the pictures for him and then had gotten sick and kind of just walked away from it all closed the doors and just left him there anyway we went down to pick up world of comedy down there we kind of noticed that everything was in disarray so we said to to harold um would it be okay f with you if we kind of recatalog the stuff and put everything back together you know we knew enough about film in those days to know that nitrate and safety shouldn't have been stored together and we knew the difference between positives and negatives and all that and not only did he agree to let us do it but he said he'd pay us to do it. It's like, what? What? <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah, How I, great is that? But I remember yeah. it was about that year because it took almost a year, I think, of, of Harold kind of getting used to us and what was going on and our interest in all this thing that I think, because I remember trying to get him to open up what ultimately became the nitrate vault, the fireproof one outside there. And it was like, no, you know, there was always some kind of an excuse until eventually 
for whatever reason, that print or something else. And I remember that nobody knew how to open it. They finally got the, the combination from Walter, and he, you know, fumbled with it for you know, who knows yeah, how long. Yeah, these were like doors and they that finally got this, these for things years, open and yeah. stuff. But but I remember that that after about a year or so of him having the confidence in us to basically know that we were interested in him, the films it was like, yeah, you know, let's well, let's get into you know cataloging this stuff and finding out where everything is. Because he produced his own movies, um, you know, the people who worked for Harold Lloyd were the only people with keys to the vaults, of which I think there were, had been maybe two, Jack Murphy and Duncan Mansfield before us. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly he, you know, was willing to and had enough, had enough trust in us to turn the keys over to us, which was actually a big honor. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, this was an incredibly valuable collection of films, especially old silent films. Um, a lot of the original nitrate negatives and everything were in there and you know he he wanted to make sure that we weren't going to hurt him but he also trusted us to do what we were going to do, do right. and re, you know catalog the stuff make lists of all the stuff try to take care of the nitrate as best as possible because there's a lot of different ways to take care of nitrate but it was an honor for us because you know somebody like Harold Lloyd turning the keys to the vault over these young guys was really something and then you know we would go down there I, you know when I think of Harold, some of the most fond memories I have of him was when we would be like out on the perambula, you know, mm -hmm. uh, working in the vault and he'd come down on a Sunday or something and sit there yeah, just hang in out a chair us. and like we would take, we would take a film off the shelf and it would say, um, the kid brother and he'd say, okay, well now the kid brother was my second to last silent film and I made this picture in 1927 and here's what we did in it and we shot some of it in Catalina and we really bought this Oh, you know, this boat and actually shot in the bilge water down below. And, you know, when I was doing Why Worry, I'd do this. And so mm -hmm. it was like this on the job training history course that we would get from him that you couldn't buy for a million bucks. I yeah. mean, here was a, a film pioneer, a, a guy, this, the status of Harold Lloyd, who sat there with us as friends and, you know, was offering us lemonade and stuff and telling us about his career as we were physically handling the film, right. going through the film. And, um, he had an area also on the estate called the cutting room where these compilations were put together and that was our kind of headquarters because we had light boxes and stuff and we'd go through all these films and make sure everything was okay and that the films weren't deteriorating and everything. And then we talked him into um, retransferring a lot of the nitrate film because some of this stuff had been transferred over the years anyway. Um, but it had been done on optical printers instead of contact printers. Contact printers uh, actually are far superior for making uh, copies of nitrate film. So we talked him into spending a little bit of money and re-establishing a, a really good collection of backup safety material. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, the truth is I, I'm kind of proud that we had, you know, something to do with the preservation of that collection. Yeah. We also... As time went by, uh, Sue became my girlfriend. I, uh, we were very romantic and had this hot relationship, and her best friend ended up Jennifer, being, yeah. being his girlfriend. So the but the girls... Four of us were always together. The girls were fascinated that we had this interest in the old movies, and then Sue herself got interested in what we were doing and helped us catalog stuff, label stuff, take stuff to the, to the lab... Uh, especially, you know, make sure all the stills were in order. He, I mean, Harold never threw out anything. He had, he had nitrate eight by ten negatives of stills. He had press books. He had every, the makeup kit, the glasses, everything. He kept everything, and we were fascinated by it. And then as kids, we, this became kind of like a quest of ours. But everybody was interested. I can remember calling up Sue, calling Sue up and saying, "You want to go on a date?" And we'd end up, you know go into a film lab. I mean, what kind of a date is that? But I mean, for us, it was fun. And she got involved in that. And then I think she was, you know, fascinated by it too. And then later on, you know, that paid off because after he passed away, there was still an active family member who took this interest in preserving the collection. Yeah, well, we loved visiting with him and he loved us. And he had that, uh, his own room that was off of his, you know, the, the master bedroom and stuff that was his, his little den and stuff where we'd always get together. And, and he was a master at games and things like that. So he would always have some sort of game or puzzle that he would have figured out. 
remember? <laughs> we would later on find reams and reams of paper where on some kind of mathematical thing, he had figured all this stuff out, and so he knew all the Combinations answers. of numbers, he, he remembered right. these combinations so he had of some numbers, kind of thing. him like cheat. Yeah, so he, you know, <laughs> if you, once you would come in, he goes, ah, I got this new thing, boys, come here and look at this thing. He goes, now, if you pick this number and you do this and stuff, I have to be the last one to end up with the proper number, and no matter what we did, he always won because he knew all the combinations. And no matter, you know, that was always funny. But I always remember too. He was is, setting uh, us up. He was always setting us up. He yeah, always yeah. knew. You know, he had the answers to everything long before, you know, he would you know show us this you know new game or puzzle and something. We yeah, he that. had this thing about the the main fountain at the house, and that whenever we exited, you could never go around it in a complete circle. In other words, you had to, if you were parked facing the house, as Dave said, you had to back around and then go out. And the funny thing is, and this went on for years and years, I think Sue, as long as she could remember, remembered that he would never go around the circle in a complete thing. And uh, when he died, he died in the home, and when the coroner came to take the body away, they backed up and went around the fountain in a complete circle and down the hill, which was so weird. It was the yeah. first thing that we noticed. Because we were there that day and we watched that happen, and it's the only time I can ever think ever of him was really going around. around the circle, which was amazing. But he had the first time I noticed that he was superstitious is you know we put him in the car to take him someplace, and we started to go around. No, 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 you can't do that. Mm. I mean, adamant, he wouldn't let us. He'd get out of the car before he'd let us do that. Then we started to realize that he was the kind of guy that um, wouldn't, who didn't want to go under a ladder. As a matter of fact, there's a gag in mm -hmm. Safety Last when he starts to walk back into the department store thinking it's going to be his lucky day and there's a guy with a ladder and he stops himself short and goes around. The thing about a black cat, he didn't want to see, have yeah, a black cat. That, that was in Grandma's Boy. He's going to go in through a door in Grandma's Boy and a black cat crosses his path so he decides to go around the opposite way, which is why he's safe. So, I mean, if you look back on what was written for movies in the early 20s and then you saw the guy later on, I'm sure the superstition thing stayed with him a long time, but he was superstitious. He didn't want to go um, by or under the Third Street Tunnel. Uh, Hal Roach had a studio above the Third Street Tunnel originally in downtown L.A. Why he didn't want to do that was not explained, but it may have been that somebody was hurt. During, as a matter of fact, some of the early climb movies were made over the Third Street Tunnel. Uh, he didn't want to drive down Roxbury drive by his mother's home after she died. He didn't want to go right. that way. And he also was adamant about if we if we went on a long drive, I don't care where it was, if we left LA and we went down to Anaheim, to Disneyland, or we went out to visit uh, Sterling Holloway and Palos Verdes or whatever it was, we'd have to come back the same way we went. Mm, that's we right. couldn't take a shortcut coming back. If we went the long way, we had to come back the long way. If we went the short way, we had to come back the short way. He had all of these superstitions, yeah. you know? And he was really adamant about sticking with that because maybe, maybe he felt that in his life he had been extremely lucky. Um, at a time when he and his dad were broke, they flipped a coin, which is basically a superstition as to whether to go to the East Coast or the West Coast. And it said West Coast, and he came out here, got in the movie business, and out, you know, the rest was history. So I think right from the very beginning, he not only was superstitious, but I think he believed in the superstitions in that oh, yeah. you could have good luck doing one thing and bad luck doing something else. So. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you, you say. Well, once Harold Lloyd left working with Hal Roach and Roach Studios and everything and, and struck out on his own to produce his own films and everything with uh, um, Harold Lloyd Productions, he was financing it. He owned everything. He owned the rights to everything. And that was the thing. From from there on, of course, they were all his his pictures. So he had control over them. The prints went out. The prints came back for most most of the stuff. Yeah, he had complete say on how they were going to be advertised. He had complete say on uh, all the publicity and the publicity tours, what was being shown as trailers, what was being made to publicize his name, because Harold Lloyd Corporation that owned all that stuff, you know, paid for it too. And so they were they dealt with Paramount primarily as a distributor, but the distributor was was really taking orders from Harold and right. his company. But um, I think too, because the, the prints would go out, not like today where 3,000 prints would go out for a release, it'd be a, a fewer amount obviously, but once they came back, they came back, he had control over them and that was it. Because then the next, you know, two, re two reader or one reader was coming out the next week as they were doing them, you know, like once a week as they were, you know, producing them back in the, uh, the teens and stuff. But from there on, that was the thing, is he owned the control over this. And when it came to television, and uh, you know the, the the 
Chaplin pictures and Laurel and Hardy and all that stuff is people lost control over those films. They went into public domain and people bought them up and they went on TV. And you correct me if, if, if you, it's something different, but that was the thing is a lot of people in the early generations of TV now were seeing Laurel and Hardy, Charlie Chaplin, a few things of Keaton and stuff, but they never saw any of Harold's work because they were sitting in the vaults at Harold's property. Yeah, he was very careful about copywriting the pictures and keeping the copyrights renewed, but he wanted to control how the films would be distributed, whether mm -hmm. it was television or theatrically or however. And so generations started to go by where people, you know, didn't know who he was because the films just weren't out in the marketplace anymore, which was his choice. Yeah, well, I think he told us, too, that at some point, I don't remember when, maybe you know, late 50s or something, there was something where somebody had contacted him about the possibility of releasing his films on TV, and the deal wasn't right. Whatever it was, he wasn't comfortable with it, so he wasn't going to let them go out because they weren't going to do it the way that he wanted them presented. It was either they didn't, weren't going to have the, the proper score or something. I forgot what well, it was. Well, see, something else that people have to keep in mind is that uh, a lot of movie stars who didn't own their films, and even some who did, later on when their careers were kind of over and they went into other things, they weren't that smart. Uh, Harold Lloyd never had a money problem. He was a big investor in real estate. Uh, he kept very active in all kinds of, of activities that dealt with his money. He was smart about how he spent and saved his money. And so even up till the day he died, he was a very wealthy man. Um, and so this money was invested properly and a lot of people like Laurel and Hardy and Buster Keaton and people like that who not only didn't have the control over the films, um, they, they needed the money. Had they been in that situation, they may have done what you said is sold the rights to someone to distribute in TV. Harold Lloyd said, look, if the deal's not right, I don't need the money, so it's either got the deal has to be right or I'm not going to give the movies to anybody. And that's what happened. He wanted to control everything and, you know, as the studio systems took over and as networks took over, people lost control of stuff like that, except he financially wasn't in a position to worry about that, so he, he just said, care. okay, I'll leave him in the vault then. The, the, the downside of that was he lost a generation of fans who later on just simply had no idea who he was, which is a disaster because not only was he one of the biggest stars of the 20s, as a matter of fact, at times outselling Chaplin, but he was certainly one of the biggest film comedians that ever lived. And I don't think now he has his rightful place in history, at least not yet. The revivals of the films may change that. But because he stayed out of the public view for so many years, people, in a way, forgot, generations forgot who he was. Yeah. Harold Lloyd had his film career, and then he had the career at the Shriners of being the chairman of the board of the, for the crippled children's hospitals. That was his lifelong job aside from the movie star thing, and when the movie star thing ended in, in the late 30s, he dove into the Shriner thing even bigger to be this guy who really ran these hospitals and kind of spearheaded the whole thing. In 49, they made him imperial potentate of the entire Shrine, which means he was in charge of the whole thing. So that started off as charitable work. I don't think he was ever making any money on that, but he was always aligned with people in the street and people who needed help, and you know, he, he was a charitable guy. I think the Shrine thing was a huge part of that. But that also became, you know, something that took over his life a lot. He was a huge Shriner. He was, well, he was the Imperial Potentate of the whole thing. But he also was, he died in office as chairman of the Crippled Children's Hospital, which I think are the biggest, is the biggest result of all the money that's pooled by the Shriners as it goes into these hospitals, and he was in charge of the whole thing. Right. Well, I think, you know, I mean, sound, regardless of what any silent film personality or comedian, whoever, tells you sound really didn't enhance any of those people with the exception of very very few of them Garbo Laurel and Hardy they were actually better with sound I think that Harold Lloyd sound pictures with the exception of maybe two of them are inferior movies to the silent films not only the speed but the kind of characters he played um, they just weren't as as good as the other films and so I think he was looking back once the time sound started and he, he didn't like to be in that position then, of course, the studio system took over where everybody was in charge and not, not the actor. Even if you produced your own movies in a way, you were still answering to a studio. And so he became completely disenchanted with that. But I think, you know, Cat's Paw, 
Not a great movie. It didn't do that well. Um, I think The Milky Way was a much better movie directed by Leo McCary. was a much better filmmaker. But still, I think in 1936, people were interested in Fields. They were interested in the Marx Brothers. They were interested in Laurel and Hardy. They were interested in... There was a lot more competition, and these guys were using their voices very, very well. By the time he made Professor Beware, which I happen to think is a very good movie, uh, he made that for Paramount. He was just disenchanted with the whole thing. He didn't like that movie. I thought he was very, very good in it. But by that time, it seemed that he had soured on the whole business because he soured on that movie almost representative of how he felt about the business. And I, and I think it was a pretty good movie. The public didn't really go to see it that much. It wasn't, Harold Lloyd was a bit old news by that time. And, and Harold didn't want to be old news. He was still a young man, but he didn't want to be old news. If that's the case, he would rather have gone into something else and done something else. And that's the way it is, you know. Uh, uh, most really, really great movie stars are huge stars for about 12 to 15 years. There's ex exceptions where people have been stars for 50 years or 40 years, whatever. But most of them are in their prime about 15 years or so. And Lloyd had been in his prime for 20 years. And so by that point, it was, I think he thought, well, I'm moving on to the next thing. I was just going to say financing, too, is, you know, because he had been you know, financing you know, his own pictures. Now they're getting more expensive, and he's going, I'm not going to put out that kind of money, and you know, things like that might have been part of it, too. And then they started making films you know, every two years. And yeah, you know, just it was, it's, you know, the public just taste slow changed, process. you know, and people saw. I mean, look, Harold Lloyd's primary you know, career was as a silent movie comedian. And when he made silent movies, even the technique of his silent movies are, are better than anyone's. They're better than Chaplin's, they're better than Keaton's. Beautifully photographed, really well directed, great editing, great gags. Guy was really, really in his prime. And he's remembered and thought of as a silent film comedian. And that's really the way it should be because those were his best movies. Uh, I think he was, you know, as Dave has said, because of the financing and the lack of control and whatever it is that he didn't, he didn't want to continue in, in his career without having control over it, because when he did have control over it, he was very popular and very successful. He backed away. I think he backed away at a great time to back away. My only regret about his career is because he owned his own movies and vaulted them for two generations, the people seem to have forgotten who he was. And even worse, they seem to have not put him in his proper place historically with the film business because he was a huge star. You couldn't get any bigger. I don't care if you were Pickford or Fairbanks or Chaplin or anyone, you could not get any bigger than that. And, and unfortunately today people don't remember that um, as much as they should. And hopefully exposure to the films will remind them. I hope. Um, you know, an interesting story, uh, about Harold Lloyd working with uh, other people too is you know he in his career he was very very well liked, um, great with the crew, great with leading ladies. For some reason, a lot of the leading ladies that worked with Harold Lloyd would get married, not to him, but married like to you know. The, the next thing they did was to get married. That <laughs> happened to a number of them. But anyway, um, the press was interviewing Howard Hughes around 1956. And they said to him, you know, uh, Mr. Hughes, in your film career, tell us who the most difficult actor you ever worked with. Who, who was that? And immediately he said, Harold Lloyd. And everyone thought, well, that's unusual because Harold Lloyd had this great reputation of how nice he was on stage and everything. And they said to Howard Hughes, well, what's the matter? Why, how come you didn't get along with Harold Lloyd? Wasn't he a good actor? And Hughes said, no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't that he wasn't a good actor. The problem with Harold Lloyd is he had so much of his own damn money, he didn't care what I thought of him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there is that story that, that Harold was telling us that it was after Sins of Harold Diddlebach was about to come out or whether it had been recut to be Mad Wednesday, whatever the thing oh, was yeah. is that Howard Hughes had had a hand in recutting the film. And uh, I think, I forgot where they were exactly, but Harold, it was like in the bathroom or something. Yeah, and he was standing like it, at the urinal and Howard Hughes walks in and Howard goes, Oh, hi, Harold. What do you think of my new cut of the picture, which Harold had just seen? And he goes, you could have cut it better with an ax. You know, I mean, <laughs> Harold was pissed. He was really unhappy with the new cut of the thing. So that was the deal, you know. Here is, you know, Harold Lloyd and the, one of the wealthiest men in the world and, and pretty 
powerful in his own right and stuff. And just Blue Arrow was not afraid of it at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He just you said, know? yeah, yeah, you could have cut it better with an axe, you know, type of thing. So. He said, you know, stick to the tool in the aircraft business, Howard. <laughs> you know, I'll take care of the movie end of things. That's great. I mean, it's because he was honest. That's how he was. Fortunately, Mr. Lloyd, they were quite a couple, you know, a very loving couple. And they, they had Susie there, and then Susan's mother wasn't there then. She was away being taken care of. And uh, Mr. Lloyd being a sort of uh, old-fashioned, shall we say, very, very strict. And so when Mrs. Lloyd died, then uh, if Susan had a chance to go to the prom. After all, she was 17. She was beautiful. And he said, well, she couldn't go because she couldn't go in somebody else's car and she couldn't stay past 10 or 9. <laughs> it was amazing. And so um, I remember going into his office and probably Susie can add something about my, before I met with him, she and I met, I know, and we talked about that. Susie was in tears because she just couldn't stand that she couldn't go to the prom. Because it's not like, I mean, here she, she's beautiful, she has a date, and now he wasn't, he couldn't drive her, he could be alone with her, he had to have her home like almost at dinner time. <laughs> And so there was an occasion where she and I talked about it, and I said, well, I'll meet with him. And she was, oh, no, you're not going to meet with Grandpa, you know. Well, she didn't call him Grandpa. I'm not sure what her nickname was, but she'll tell you. And I did go into the den, and it was very beautiful wood den and a lot of wonderful books. And I sat there like a little girl in front of him. And I said, you know, Mr. Lloyd, you really have to let Susie go to the prom. He said, well, I don't have to do anything, but I want to do what I can do, what I uh, can live with. I said, well, you have to let her be a child. First of all, you have to let her be a little girl. I mean, she, this is it. You can't redo it. You can't go back and go to the prom when you're grown and you're married. And, you know, you can't take her youth away from her just because you're famous and rich and worried. We're all going to worry about our children. So you're going to have to let go a little bit and let her go to the prom. Well, it was totally against his good wishes. He d he was really a wreck. I didn't get to sit with him, but I'm sure he would have been a, a nervous wreck. But Susie had a good time. That's all that mattered. I'm sure she had to come in kind of early, but nevertheless, she had a lot of fun. There were some other occasions where I went over and would sit in the den. I'd say, you know, a female, I was raising my children at the same time, and I felt that he was a little too, uh, strict with her out of his love and concern, but he was very exceedingly old-fashioned, too much so. Well, I think that he should have taken a course in uh, business, how to make out a better will. Well, I was quite shocked because I didn't realize that Mr. Lloyd had left his whole estate to the motion picture industry, and at that time the Academy turned it down which is rather stupid, <laughs> to say the least. And I'm sure they regretted it, but hindsight. And uh, Susie and I, she was just a little girl, you know. She was only 15, 16. And uh, we, we tried to get Jack Haley Jr., Liza Minnelli, everybody to go to this auction. It was an auction, live auction, on Benedict Canyon. And we, we, I was touring, and I, I didn't have the money at the time. My husband absconded with all my money. <laughs> so it's one of those things in history. Had I had the money. It was sold for a, a million and a half, a million, three, four, six, something like that, to some gentleman from another country. And we were quite devastated because that, of course, was divided. And it never should have, it could have not been divided. And it should have been left to Susie, if not left to the industry. It's just a mistake of intelligence on our industry's part. And so Susan and I tried very hard then to buy it, you know, to get a group of five people could have bought it. Can you imagine uh, 11 acres? It's silly and so gorgeous and never to be found again. And then I went over with Susan to the her house after the, the death of Mr. Lloyd and we were able to pick up a few little items that we never discussed with anyone and put them in my station wagon. And uh, for Susan, personal pictures, you know, that she wasn't even allowed that, to go in and have her dad's desk or, oh, it was just really very wrong. The freshman, for a while, the freshman was extremely unpopular among American college kids because it was so near the knuckle they couldn't stand it. Life has changed so much now that they can look at it objectively 
and see what a masterpiece it is. But for a long time, you found people really reacted against that picture. Um, so he had the ability to reflect the times he lived in much more strongly than the other comics. And that's probably why the, re the reason why he was top of the box office in, in the 20s. Um, mind you, Chaplin made three comedies. He worked very slowly. At the time that Chaplin made three comedies, Lloyd had done 11. And they were all first rate. They all stand up superbly today. To see Harold Lloyd film is to see a time capsule of the period he lived in, because he's more than the other comedians, he's, he draws on ordinary life and people could recognize themselves. So it's prohibition, it's gangsterism, it's uh, working in a department store. Um, but above and beyond that is his ability to um, create the embarrassment that was caused by the prejudice of the time. You have particularly class structure. They say American isn't, America isn't a, a class-ridden society. But in Safety Last, when the girl is so desperate for him to be managing the department store that he becomes the manager in a brilliantly orchestrated sequence, um, the embarrassment that he might be found out the terror that he might be found out is still is still strong even to this day. It's extraordinary. So the the comedian was everything. The everybody worked to what that comic wanted, so that the directors were subsidiary, unlike today, and. Often, the comic himself could direct the scene. But everybody working on a Lloyd film, they put their ideas to him. So he was the filter through which everything was decided. And so you could say that he was one of the, it's perfectly true that he was one of the great filmmakers, because it was his decision that led to what you saw on the screen. And what you saw on the screen is filmmaking of an extremely high order once he gets going into features. Um, he had uh, two regular directors, Fred Newmeyer and Sam Taylor. Uh, Sam Taylor was the brilliant one and I think contributed much more than most directors. Whereas Fred Newmeyer, you can see the work he did for other people was not distinguished, whereas Taylor's was. Taylor went on to direct John Barrymore and Norma Talmadge and Beatrice Lilly. Um, but it was Lloyd who was the genius, and there's no doubt about it. And, and yet, when you met him, he was a real Midwesterner. Uh, it's as though he'd, he'd read how to win friends and influence people and swallowed it you know <laughs> he was um he was so charming and he was, he was so charming you, you were slightly suspicious you know this man can't be that nice but he he really was he was uh, and for a, a kid like i was he was just starting out in this business he he was um, he was an absolute godsend Harold Lloyd's films serve as the most fantastic record of a city any city could ask for. Um, and uh, I remember in Girl Shy, when we were making the documentary, we discovered the, how the pit shot was done, where they literally stuck the camera in a manhole and had the, a cart right over, over the top of it. Just extraordinary. And you can see how the the people making the Ben Hur chariot race looked back at the girl shy chase and took the took the best elements from it. And uh, Lloyd had a, a, a tremendous influence on other filmmakers. Yes, the cameramen were often on platforms uh, on the front of the vehicles that Harold was in. <laughs> you have to remember that. In uh, for heaven's sake, um, the most astounding sequence of a of a a wild bus ride through LA and the bus was on rockers so that it would he heel over keel over as it goes around corners and the things they did were just 
extraordinary. And there really was no need for it because people would have accepted something far less. Uh, but he always went that extra mile. For, for, and then he previewed his pictures. Irving Tholberg credited him with inventing the preview, which he may well have done. He, it's a very important thing because comedies don't work cold. You can't just sit down with two people. <laughs> it sounds like watching this DVD. You, you have to put them on the screen and the audience will tell you whether it works or not. And that's what Lloyd did. He would take his pictures, he would put them in front of an audience, knowing they would work to a degree, but he wanted them to work to a special degree. And he would go back and reshoot anything which didn't get the laugh that he felt it should have done. So he was spending money to an inordinate degree and getting, getting fantastic results because he was the top box office comedian of his day. The invention of sound brought the really high standard of comedy to an end, and another kind of comedy took over. Chaplin was the only one brave enough to carry on making silent pictures, and he didn't make his first talkie till 1940. But the curious thing is, Lloyd's first, Lloyd, if you think how many decisions that, that man had to make throughout his feature career, and they were all correct, if, if you admire him as much as I do and find his films as funny as I do. And yet his first sound film, it seemed to me all his decisions were wrong. And Welcome Danger is, to me, I, I find it very hard to watch. Now, he quickly recovered and he made some very interesting sound films and one terrific one called Movie Crazy. Um, but it was impossible to carry on making the same sort of improvised comedy that he was used to, where he would work on a sequence, shoot it, preview it, didn't work, work back, reshoot it again till he got it right. You couldn't do that with uh, with with sound. Um, you had you could preview it and so on, but you really had to get it right first time and just tweak it. So it, it affected all the comedians. I mean, Keaton was the worst affected. Um, and that era of comedy was over. Well, Lloyd said he didn't use scripts, that they worked on minute notes taken at gag conferences. The most important element of a Lloyd picture was the gag conference. They'd come in the morning without an idea in their head They'd all sit round a table, and one of them would say, well, how about if Harold does... And then it was up to the other one to top him. And then it was up to the other one to top him. And by building on the gags, you got infinitely stronger situations. And that was the way he worked. And always it was Harold who'd say, that's the one. Lloyd would say, we had islands to go to. So you had the basic idea, the Mexican Revolution, and Lloyd is a, a, a just a tourist who gets caught up in, in, in the action. And they would know that certain things would happen, and they would work towards those. Then they would preview it, and if they didn't get laughs, they'd go back and work on that bit that didn't get the laughs until it did get the laughs. And you can see a film like Why Worry was so successful that Paramount Pictures, with Raymond Griffith, who was a brilliant comedian in his own right, would steal the whole thing, set it in Spain, and without any, with, I just don't know how they had the gall to do it. But the nightclub is a complete steal from Why Worry. It's a very funny film in its own right, but without Harold, it wouldn't have existed. <laughs> I always think that comedy films were, gave the impetus to the art of editing in the cinema pictures began as one-minute incidents, and then they got joined up. But it wasn't until comedies came along and pace and the, the, the slapstick demanded that editing became an art in its own right. And uh, 
Lloyd pictures were always brilliantly edited. Editing was a very important part of, of Lloyd's pictures and Tom Kreiser was his cutter. Uh, but in those days, the title writer was crucial and he had H.M. Beanie Walker as his title writer. Uh, and some of the, um, some of the titles are, are brilliant. Um, but it, 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 it's the gag men, I think, are the strongest element of the Lloyd crew. And um, many of them went on to to work for for other comedians, but also some of them. I mean, Sam Taylor became a great director, and several of them became directors. The beauty of of those comedies were that. They were so fresh that they were shot on actual occasions, and what you see people doing, they're actually doing. With modern films are amazingly spectacular, but somehow you feel that there's somebody with a computer enabling people to do the incredible. But Harold did the incredible, and he really did it. And in some of those thrill pictures, if you remember that he hasn't got a complete hand, He's doing stunts which are breathtaking by any standards. And he, when he's tearing through New York in a streetcar or hurtling around corners in a bus, there are special effects being used, but they're, they're having to do the essential work for real. And the cameras are often in, in as much danger as, <laughs> as the comedian. And, that gives these pictures an extraordinary edge. Harold was absolutely devoted to the importance of story in comedy. So many funny pictures were a series of disconnected gags. But Lloyd believed first and foremost in character so that you, you came to like the character, love the character to which all these things were going to happen. And then the story that that character played the leading part in had to be really strong. Whereas when he made Grandma's Boy, which I think remained his favorite, Hal Roach insisted that it be covered in gags. And at the preview, the picture didn't work. And they, they, they had to take these many of these out and put it back to what Harold had wanted, which was a character comedy. Um, and it was one of the most successful character comedies ever made. The Rogues Gallery was a very famous gallery that Harold created. And where he put it was uh, downstairs at Green Acres. And there was a long hallway. I would say it was maybe a hundred feet long, maybe even more than a hundred feet. Long hallway, and he went down this hallway and it wound up in this beautiful bar, kind of nightclub sort of atmosphere and had a great view out over the part of the golf course that he had built. And I mean, it was sensational. And he had all of these pictures of people that he had met in his life uh, that had been had responded to his character and also that he knew that he had met. And they ranged from Henry Ford, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, he had l many political figures, uh, people that were involved in uh, the military and actors, of course, and people that he had worked with. and. I mean, it was an extraordinary collection. It's an extraordinary collection. And I believe the estate still has it. And I think that it's going on tours, as I know. I think that uh, Susie, Susan Lloyd, who is the granddaughter, is taking it out and around America to be seen because, I mean, it's just so unique. And there were many, many famous people in this. And uh, one day, he said, I'd like to have you in the gallery. 
And I was so, that was one of the highest compliments that I've ever been paid. So I am in the gallery. So when it goes on tour, I'm gonna be sure my picture's wiped off very well so it can be seen and I have the right light on it and everything, you know. But he put it in a very good spot and I was thrilled. The whole family, all of them, have always been absolutely so caring and generous to me over my lifetime. And I, uh, I couldn't have been, I mean, it was a real gift. I was a kid, I was a young man, I wanted to be in the business, I wanted to be an actor. I was so thrilled at being, even in his presence, and being taken in and being trusted by him to be around him. And how he helped me was he put his arm around me and he said, you know, you could be something. You could go someplace, you know? That's how he helped me. That's, that's meaningful, that was what it meant to me. If I had went to him and I said, you know, I got this uh, scene, he said, he'd say, well, great, you know, just do the best you can with it and give it everything and, you know, work on it, give it everything you have, you know? Because you, you're good, you could be somebody. From Harold Lloyd, hello? That's good, that's meaningful. So I knew Mr. Lloyd to me uh, casually, and um, one day I had to do a, a, pro a 10th grade project, and I called Sue and asked if I could call her grandfather and see if I could interview him for it, and he said, absolutely. So I brought over what was then a kind of kid's tape recorder, and I set it up and I asked him some questions about his work, and again, he was always very candid and very forthcoming, and he always did a little bit like giving you advice too, but this is how I did it. You know, he told me some of his famous stories, like the way he s snuck into the studio in an extras costume to get work, and it was always a little bit saying, kid, if you want to make it, you just got to try a little harder. He had a real, real Americana. And anyway, so after the end of this incredibly generous long interview, he said, um, by the way, did you test your tape recorder? And I said, um, no. He said, why don't you just make sure it was working? So I rewound a little bit <clears throat> and played it. And of course, none of it had come through. So then he very sweetly again said, well, you know, um, when you're doing something like this and you're asking someone to do something like this, uh, you should probably test the equipment. So I, I, I took that lesson to heart. I first met Harold Lloyd and Mildred uh, through uh, their son, Harold Lloyd Jr. And I'd go up to the house, and he asked me up there, and I've never seen a mansion quite like that. That was unbelievable. I'll remember, I do remember the, the, the music room, the loge, or whatever they called it, the music room. It was this enormous room with these hand-painted birds all across the ceiling. And I remember asking uh, Harold Sr. one time, I said, Mr. Lloyd, that ceiling is all hand done. I said, but why are the birds a little larger at that one end of the room? And he said, well, Tab, he said, you know, after a year and a half of walking down here, I saw this guy lying on his back with the scaffolding up there painting. And I said, are you still up there? And the guy said, yes, Mr. Lloyd. He said, how long have you been there? He said, oh, about a year and a half, two years. He said, well, hurry up and get that done. So that's why the birds are larger at that end of the room. <laughs> it's quite wonderful. When I first met the, the Lloyds, it was right after I, it was after I'd done Island of Desire, which was the first film I starred in, an independent film with my new name. You know, where does one serve one's apprenticeship? Being a product of Hollywood is very difficult. I never had any formal training, so it was extremely difficult. And then I had that long spell where I was in every movie magazine in America on the covers and this and that, but the product was exceeding, I mean, the publicity was exceeding the product. I wasn't working, I couldn't get a job. So I just hung out with Harold Jr. and uh, just went with the flow. I wasn't really serious until a while later when it came to Battle Cry, and then I realized, hey, wait a minute, wake up. This is the area you wanna go in. This is what you wanna do. You'd better damn well learn your craft. The room where I'm sitting is, it's an amazing, 
experience for me to be sitting here because this was Harold Lloyd's Beach House. This house is located on the historic Pacific Coast Highway. At the time that it was built, at a cost of $14,000, this was known as Ocean Front. That was the name of the street. Next door neighbors were William Randolph Hearst and Marion Davies. Up the street was the writer Anita Luz. This was a safe haven, a private retreat for the family on the beach. This house has had a tremendous history. A great number of luminaries have lived here. The first person outside of the actual Lloyd family to live here was Jack Davis, who was Mildred Davis Lloyd's little brother. After he got out of military school, uh, out of the Navy and was a military doctor, he lived here. And directly after that, Jack Lemon and his first wife lived here. Peter Lawford had a, had a home down the street and he used to come here. Marilyn Monroe has been here. John F. Kennedy was here when he and Lawford were great pals. And so this house has a great history. It's hosted many, many luminaries and it's really, it's a, if these walls could talk, oh boy. <laughs> What's interesting about Lloyd, if you look at the, the great comics, if you look at um, Chaplin, you, it's about a, a silhouette. It's an iconic silhouette. So Chaplin is a bowler and those baggy pants and the big shoes and a cane and a little mustache. I mean, these, these, you know, Groucho is a painted on mustache and a cigar and a grouch. You, you, can, you can see them immediately, Laurel and Hardy with the, with the derbies, you know, and uh, they're instant silhouettes. And Lloyd's was a boater hat. That always blew me away because he played such a normal person. He was always uh, essentially a go-getter, an eager beaver. You know, um, he was never, rarely an outsider. I mean, Keaton was often an outsider. Chaplin was always an outsider. Laurel and Hardy were usually outsiders. Um, but Lloyd was always a, sort of a middle-class guy. And he had those glasses and that hat, and that was his instant, usually a bow tie. And the thing about Harold Lloyd that's so marvelous to me is the physical invention. And the fact that he wasn't, he wasn't like Keaton, a superb athlete. He wasn't, uh, he was just a, a hard-working craftsperson. If you look at the, you know, luck, are they Lonesome Luke, the early, the early stuff, they're kind of boring, <laughs> they're not that interesting. And once he got into this persona, you know, and Speedy and, and stuff like that, he's so American. Of all of them, I think, other than Keaton, he's the most American. And one of the great things about a Harold Lloyd film is you, you can show it to a 10-year-old, just bring a kid up and say, watch this. What is it? It's in black and white. You know, just watch it. And they'll laugh their ass off. In terms of laughs per minute, some of his films are the most laughter filled. He was pretty scientific about it. You know, he used to test with a stopwatch and stuff. I don't know if I could do that. But what happened was he resulted in these films that had clocked in at a certain amount of laughs per minute. And they build, they escalate. If you sit in a theater and with a full house watching a Harold Lloyd film, they are laughing loudly. They're really funny. And that's Pretty damn impressive, you know, how many years later, almost 100 years later, to say, uh, look. Harold Lloyd always tried to do his best to take care of his films, and on his estate, Green Acres, he had uh, nitrate film vaults, uh, and he very wisely stored his prints and his negatives in different vaults on the estate. Unfortunately, in one hot summer, I think it was 1943, he had a film fire and about a third of his collection got burned up, including the original camera negative for The Freshman and some of his other great films. But he did have prints of The Freshman, st fortunately stored in one of his other vaults, and so the film survived. Uh, when Harold Lloyd decided to reissue The Freshman in the 1950s and then again in the 60s under the title Harold Lloyd's Funny Side of Life, he actually had to copy an old work print, just a print of The Freshman that had splices in it uh, that was okay but wouldn't have been as, obviously was not as good as if he had still had the original camera negative. Um, and so prints of the freshmen that had been seen in the 50s and the 60s were not bad, but 
Fortunately, we were able to revisit the freshman in the 1990s. And I'm very happy that Richard Simonton, back in the 70s, had discovered, even though the original picture negative of the freshman had been destroyed in that 1943 fire, there was another original negative. What a lot of people don't realize is that in the days of silent movies, they used to shoot often two original camera negatives. Uh, one for use making the prints that went to the American theaters, the other for the prints that were made for other countries of the world, especially Europe. Now, why did they have to do that? It's because duplicating film was very poor back in the 20s. You couldn't make a dupe negative that looked any good then. It was grainy, it didn't come out, the sparkle was gone. So the way to have good prints everywhere was to print from the camera negative. And for America, they printed from the domestic camera negative. For Europe, they printed from their second negative. And what they often did was they would use second best and third best takes for Europe and the best takes for America. But in the case of Harold Lloyd, he was such a perfectionist. He did that for some of the scenes in The Freshman. He used second best takes where other characters were involved. But all of the big comedy scenes, the scenes of the fall frolic, you know, where he loses his tuxedo, the football match at the end, he had a second camera set up. And that second foreign negative was edited exactly the same as the domestic version. The action is exactly the same. The same extras in the background dancing are in the same positions. Harold's comedy is exactly the same. And so when we came to do The Freshman at UCLA about 10 or 15 years ago, we were able to go back to a copy that Richard Simonton had made to fine grain stock from, at that time, the surviving foreign negative called College Days. And I was able to incorporate at least the sequences where the contents were exactly the same as the domestic version, so we were able to make the, the sparkle come back to, the, to large parts of, of the movie. I'm very pleased about that. Let me say, say this. I am very proud of the fact that the archive over the years has been committed to preserving that whole body of work of Harold Lloyd because Harold Lloyd is so important to the culture. Again, there's a way that sometimes people dismiss movies and say, that's ah, popular culture. Well, that's why they're important <laughs> because they do reflect the culture and Harold Lloyd is a fantastic example. I mean, for me at least, the character that Harold Lloyd developed over time, uh, particularly in important films like uh, Safety Last and Grandma's Boy and, and um, The Freshman, is a quintessential American character. He, he, he is every man. He's the ordinary guy. He's the guy next door. Uh, he's not Superman. He's Clark Kent. He is the guy with the mild-mannered exterior and the glasses who beneath the surface has these enormous resources that he can draw on. To the extent that he's so optimistic, he's so positive about the world and is so absolutely committed to winning, uh, there's a certain naivete. The naivete means sometimes you're embarrassed for him. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, he's so, he's so naive, he's so believing in himself and in the mission and what have you, you're embarrassed for him. But ultimately he transcends. I mean, Harold Lloyd is now particularly relevant because he was a nerd before his time. <laughs> and I think the glasses are really important because they suggest he's not Superman again. He's not somebody who has extraordinary powers beyond those are human being. He has great human resources, great sense of himself, and, and, and the vulnerability that comes from that naivete is absolutely endearing and very, very, very contemporary. I've been very lucky to, to, to have had the opportunity, or to have the opportunity, because we're still in the, in the middle of it, to, to remake a, a, a wonderful Harold Lloyd film called Safety Last. Um, you know, uh, one of the executives at our company came in to me one day and said, the, the, there's an opportunity to get involved in, um, in a Harold Lloyd film. They're, they're shopping the rights and they're talking about it. And there's, a, there's been a big resurgence of interest in Harold Lloyd and a number of different things. And is this something that's interesting to you? And I was really excited about it. Um, and I said, the most important thing we have to do is, and it's, it's interesting because, because there's so many wonderful films that he made, but I was thinking about what is it that's going to capture the imagination of the studio? What's going to capture the imagination of the audience? 
and and it was almost before I remembered the story because I had seen many many of his films years before in film school I said we've got to make the film where he's hanging off the clock I think it's called safety last so it was almost as though the tail was wagging the dog because I I remembered the film and the image is so strong and I said that is the quintessential Harold Lloyd image.